people think the Slackware installation is very hard, but it's easy. The complicated part is in the post installation, where the user will need to read. The Slackware project started when Patrick was student at Minnesota State University Moorhead and he was looking for a Lisp interpreter. That's when he found a GNU Linux distribution called SLS Soft Landing Linux System. He then started using this system every day. To understand better about this new system, about this new undiscovered world at this time, he found various bugs in this distribution, SLS, and began to fix them. In a short time, he did more fixes than the SLS project. He took all the patches, all the fixes, and sent them to the SLS project. And they did not implement the fixes. So I think he was a little revolted. And he made the decision to start this project, which was called Slackware. On the 17th of July 1993, around 16 minutes past midnight, uh, he made the first version of the Slackware project available via FTP. Uh, the SLS was a first generation distribution, Slackware we can say was a second generation distribution. So it was not from the first moment since it was already based on that moment, but it's a distribution with a recognized name. Also it's the oldest distribution still in development to the present day. For several, it can be used in a server because Slackware is very stable. Uh, Slackware is very trustworthy and a very, very stable distribution. It's like a rock, solid as a rock. It can be used in a common desktop for daily use. I, like several people in the world, use the Slackware distribution as their primary operating system. It can also be used as a distribution for academic use, to use in colleges or even at home for you to study the system itself. Of course, there are many things nowadays in the other distributions that are evolving in which Slackware left behind. Slackware did not follow all the technology that we have today in GNU Linux. It left a lot behind things like PAM, System D, and other things like that. But you can learn how to set up the whole system in text mode. So there's no cute interface to click on. You just open any note, there's, there's no notepad. You just open any text editor and edit inside the program. So it's very interesting for academic use as well. Slackware has a philosophy called KISS, keep it simple stupid. This philosophy was created in the US Navy in 1960 uh, with the aims to keep things as simple as possible, discarding what you don't need. So Slackware follows this same pattern, this same philosophy. You can see this in the Slackware installer. It uses a dialog box, which looks like something from the 80s or 90s a very old looking box and since the beginning it's used this same installer that is simple. You in a few keystrokes will be able to easily install Slackware. So it follows this philosophy to keep things as simple as possible. When entering the Slackware website, the novices and beginners who are starting out on the system look at the ISO of 14.2, released in 2016, and everyone looks at them and says, damn it, this is very outdated. But in fact, the version available is the stable version. Slackware works with the two principles, two categories. Packages, I could say. Uh, one is stable version, which you can use on a server. Uh, or for common use too, but in an older version. 
and it only receives security updates for the system only security patches while well, we have another version called current which is updated every day every day there are updates to slackware in the current version this version is not as stable it may break because it's a development version as the name says current um, but there are updates to it almost every day unfortunately this version does not have a download on the official site but we can find on alien bob's website who i can say is patrick's right hand man you have on his site a current version that you can download and enjoy the latest version it's in development for example in version 14.2 of the stable download from the official site it still runs with kde4 while with current uh, it runs kde5 plasma understand so there are a lot of cool updates um, you can take a look if you download the stable version you can go to the mirrors located in slash etc slash slack package slash mirrors you can go there change the mirror and switch to the current version you can upgrade the system to the current version but i don't recommend that version if you need a totally stable environment this version as i said it is stable but not as much as the stable version so no slackware is not outdated and it's being updated daily patrick has been doing an excellent job for for years, years and years. In terms of is it and is it not, there are many softwares with licenses compatible with the Free Software Foundation, but uh, it also has proprietary software. So it's not a project of 100% free software. If you access the FSF website, you'll see something like these distributions which we don't support and Slackware is on that list. It has proprietary software called XV present inside it by default. And you can remove this on installation, but it is there by default. There are other things in the extras like Google Chrome and others, Mozilla, Firefox itself. As we know, it accepts plugins which are not free software, and this goes against this question. Is if you want a distribution which is 100% free software, by default it's not 100% free software, but you can make it 100% free software. I have articles and videos teaching you how to make Slackware 100% free software only free software. We have a distribution that is derived from Slackware. They do not change anything, they only remove all software that is not free, XV among others. They created their own repository which is called Freenix, the old free Slack. So they have a Slackware which is 100% free software. So you can make Slackware 100% free software with this little trick of magic. Very cool. Yes, Slackware has a few packages by default, and if you open the Slackware ISO, you will find the whole Slackware repository around more than a thousand packages which are present in the Slackware ISOs. So there really are quite a few packages, but when you do a full install of Slackware, it will serve you very well. It gets complicated when you want to install other things. That's where the Slack Builds project comes in. The community created the Slack Builds projects, which are recipes like food recipes, recipes written in shell scripts. These are recipes that you can compile software from, make copies and much more. They don't include the program source, they include only those scripts and information that you will need. At the time I used Slackware since 2008, Slack Builds served me very well and I never had any problems. Oh, I did not find software like X or Y. I always found software using Slack Builds. It's very complete. So it's from source. You have to compile it when you use Slack Builds. You can contribute. You can contribute if you know how to program a little in shell scripts. You can contribute to the Slack Builds project. You can create your recipes for the project and it will help a lot of people. The biggest software I have in there at present is Doku Wiki. It's like Wikipedia created in PHP. And I'm the maintainer of this script, this recipe to use Doku Wiki.
so you won't get stuck only in the official packages. We also have the Slack only website which provides pre-compiled packages. You could just go there and do install package to install these packages. So there's Slack only which has much software for Slackware and there is much that you can enjoy. So Slack builds and Slack only are the ones I recommend for Slackware users. Users starting out in Slackware tend to get lost in this issue of package management. There's a lot of misinformation on the internet saying Slackware does not have a package manager. Well, that's a lie. It does have a low level package manager called Package Tools, which is a lot of tools made in shell scripts, uh, which has install package to install packages, remove package to remove packages, upgrade package to update packages. We also have make package to create a package. These are low-level managers to give you what you need. And since 2008, from the extra repo, a shell script called Slack package was also created by Brazilian Peter Punk, a hug for him, uh, was included. And this script aims to update the system's packages, upgrade, install, do all of this. So we even can put Slack package as a high-level package manager. But also it does not solve dependencies. So we have the low-level package manager package tools, which does not resolve dependencies. And Slack package, which we could call a higher-level package manager that also does not resolve dependencies. But we have these package managers. People are afraid, but there's nothing to be afraid of. It's easy to just follow the information out there, the documentation, which is all available on the internet, or go on Slackware IRC channel. You just ask your question and the guys will answer you. The Slackware community is very kind. For sure they will always help. The newbie user coming from an easier distribution, such as Linux Mint, where they give you the interface ready, use this interface because this distribution is for this, will have some problems in Slackware, but nothing that a good reading wouldn't solve. That's the cool thing about Slackware. Get this book or get this documentation and read. Read it so you can use it. And the name of the project already says this, Slackware. So the system does nothing for you. The administrator is the one who does. The administrator is the one who has to take on everything for administrating the system. So the newbie who has never used a terminal in his or her life will have a little difficulty, but nothing that a good reading would not solve, or a little research. Everybody was a newbie at one point. I was a newbie too. Everyone else was at one stage. We just got used to the system. And the power it gives to you, administratively, is very good. For those who don't know, Patrick has already had two health problems. The project paused at this time, uh, but then it continued normally. So when a problem occurs, the project will continue. We have a very strong community. It's a close-knit community. We have Patrick's right-hand men, Alien Bob, for one, does much for the project. We have Robbie Workman too. He does a lot for the project. We have these guys, and for sure, they will keep the project alive. Of course, because it's a, a personal project, what Patrick decides goes with what happens in the distribution. There's a lot of him in the project. What we see in Slackware is a lot of Patrick's vision. What will happen when someone else maintains the project? I don't know how it will be, or if the community will maintain it, I don't know. It will have a little of the vision of that person in it too. It may be the person wants to change, but the community won't allow it. Oops, let's keep the project objective. That's what happened to the Debian project. Ian Murdoch was the founder of the Debian project. He died and the project continued. Nowadays, the Debian project is as strong as ever. So the same will happen with the Slackware project. Something happened with Patrick, okay, but the project will continue, this project cannot die, it's a historical project. When accessing the Slackware project website at slackware.com, users are accustomed to this design of the 2000s. 
but some look at it and say, Jesus, why is it so old? They still use frames on the site. But the purpose of the site, such as the Project Philosophy itself, is the KISS philosophy, which is to keep things as simple as possible. He kept it, it's serving well, it's working well, it's okay. Older users use Lynx or Lynx Terminal Browser. They're browsing there, and when you enter the Slackware website, you can test there. Use the links and the URL, which is www.slackware.com. You'll see that navigation is perfect when using links. You can do everything there and much faster than clicking with a browser such as Google Chrome, Firefox, IceCat, anyway. It's so much simpler and easier using this text-based browser. Formerly, we had to make a mess. There was Slack package in the extras, but not everyone used it. So what did we do? We went to the Slackware changelog, looked at what was updated, what needed to be updated. We would go to any mirror and download it. We opened two terminals, compared and downloaded them, compared the version with that of the system. Oh, you have to upgrade. So we used the D key on links and downloaded into a directory. Then all the packages were within this directory. We would do upgrade package all dot t query z where query means any character or just tgz or txz anyway enter key and all packages were updated simple as well there are people who still do this i myself did this a lot nowadays i use slack package for convenience and to be more practical too certainly the idea of if it's working correctly there's no reason to change if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Serves this purpose well for people who use a text mode browser. For sure, it stayed that way because of this too. A fact that very few people know is that Slackware had the honor of having the first package manager in the Linux world. Launched in 1994, 93, 94. This came before DPKG, before RPM, it became before all of those. It was the first package manager in Linux history. Formerly on Unix or even in the early generations of Linux distributions, it was all done in the compilation. Everything was done manually. You had the README and you had to compile, read the README, see what was there step by step. You had to follow things then through the terminal, through practice. You had to make some adjustments to run things and to configure things manually to do a build. The package manager came to do that for you. Patrick had this vision. Let's pile up all the compiled, put it together in one place and pack it. The Slackware package is just a compressed little tar. XZ or GZ, and let's pack that. Let's pack everything you need in one place. Then what we will do what? We extract it to the root of the user. The Slackware package managers are shell scripts. Very easy to use. And the person who uses Slackware can help resolve bugs in those scripts. Very cool, that's the cool. We see more and more these days fad projects. There's a lot of versioning, like Git for example, which is very famous, and Slackware does not follow this pattern. It's more closed development where Patrick does it all. In the view of an ordinary person who is not in development this happens as if people are intruding. We go into what we put into GitHub or not a bug anyway. People want to help and that's good, but each person will want to do it in their own way. It's normal and good, the freedom that we have, but that's bad for a project that has a philosophy and follows a pattern. For example, hey, let's add system D, let's add PAM. What's impractical for the project is many people intruding, let's do this, let's do that, and it ends up not working. So Slackware does not have public versioning. One historical fact is when Slackware jumped from version 4.0 to 7.0. 
in the 1990s, the Slackware project was heavily used. But this version implied that the project was out of date. While the other distributions were at version 5, version 6, Slackware was at version 4, for example. Patrick made a marketing move. Let's jump from version 4 to version 7 to show the people that we are up to date, like the other distributions. So it was a marketing move. It didn't change much to skip three versions. Really, it was a marketing move. I hope the Slackware project has many years of road ahead and that people come to know the project and not read these things on the internet of which others speak. It's an outdated project. Not every user can use it. These things are lies. Slackware is there for your daily use on your server and will do very well with learning too. You will learn very, very much using this. Slackware Linux distribution. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much for the opportunity.